Good evening. Good evening. Uh, if everybody starts to find their seats, we'll get started. Um, I'm Jeffrey Politis. I'm the chair of the Cab Calloway School Fund. We are hosting the event tonight. Um, very exciting uh, to be hosted, hosting this event tonight. Um, you know, we, we named this the Art of Conversation, and I just, uh, you know, after hearing Maurice last time and talking to Susan a little bit earlier today, you know, I find uh, conversation is a lost art, and I think when we take time to have a conversation, we really start to, to learn about people and about the world around us. So I think the name was appropriate, and I think we'll hear Susan tonight and Bud have a conversation with all of us, and I hope you enjoy it. Um, I'm going to introduce Bud Martin tonight. Bud uh, is the executive and artistic director of the Delaware Theater Company. Bud is going to help facilitate our conversation tonight. Bud uh, got involved with us when we started deciding, when we started to say we wanted to do this. We had no idea what we were doing as the cab fund, and we went to Bud and said, we need help. And Bud graciously jumped in and said, I can help you find people, and I would participate um, with us, and we're very thankful for that. Um, so with that, I'm going to say thank you and introduce Bud Martin, who's going to take us through the program tonight. So I'm sure you would much rather um, hear from Susan than me, but anyway, one of Broadway's brightest stars for years has been Susan Stroman, and what's especially great about it is that she was born and raised in Delaware, went to Dickinson High School, <laughs> went to the University of Delaware. I think there's a lot of people in this audience that probably worked with her at the Candlelight and the Brandywiners and so forth. So. Um, one of the first things that I ever saw that Susan did was when she created and uh, developed contact for Lincoln Center. And I, I, I've never seen a story so well told just through dance. She's an amazing storyteller. She started in New York as a performer only so she could find her way into being a choreographer and then eventually a director. She's won five Tony Awards, um, which is unheard of in the industry. And, um, <laughs> So with that, we're going to start with a little uh, DVD about some of the highlights, and then I am happy to bring Susan Stroman on stage.
Hello, hello. Are these on? Hello? And this one's on. I can hear that. Great. So welcome. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here in this beautiful theater. Oh my gosh, it's lovely. Really I know. I, I say when kids get the opportunity to work in a theater like this, they go to New York, they're not going to find anything like this. So. No, it's fabulous. <laughs> it's beautiful. So we had a chance to get together this afternoon. I have seen most of her work, um, all of which has been exquisite. Um, so you left Wilmington in the late 70s. I did. Well, I'm a Delaware gal through and through. I um, went to John Dickinson High School. I graduated from the University of Delaware. But after, after that, I, I went to New York. I, um, there was, I, you know, who knows when you go to New York City if it's all going to work out. You don't know. So I went to an audition in New York for the Goodspeed Opera House. And, and they saw about 300 gals, and they chose one to be go to good speed it was a non-equity call and i got the job and i went back home and sold my car and told my mother and father i doing something called equity and i went to the good speed opera house and that's how i started i started as a song and dance gal in New York, but, but it was always wanting to be on the other side of the table, always wanting to create for the theater. But I knew I couldn't just go to New York and take over. I had to go as a song and dance gal. And, <laughs> and then um, take over. And then take over. <laughs> uh, but um, so I, I uh, the whole time I was there, I was sort of assessing the situation. And I did the national tour of Chicago uh, with Gwen Verdon and Cheetah Rivera and Jerry Orbuck. I was the Hunyak in that. And, uh, and then I did a show on Broadway called Whoopi. It was a big tap dancing show. But I started to wanting to direct and choreograph, so I started to do things like industrial shows, which were a big deal uh, back, you know, 30 years ago, where corporations would hire performers to sing and dance. So I would start to direct and choreograph those and direct people's club acts, which were also very popular 30 years ago in New York. And, um, and then I was in a, a Broadway show uh, that lasted a week on Broadway. It was called Musical Chairs. And I was with a, a fellow actor named Scott Ellis. And we were lamenting how we wish we could create for the theater and be on the other side of the table. And Scott had done the rink on Broadway with Candor and Ebb, and I had done the national tour of Chicago with Candor and Ebb, and we thought, well, what if we knock on their door and say, well, can we take one of your old shows and take it off Broadway? And they thought the worst that could happen is that they say no. But in fact, they said yes, and we took uh, Floor of the Red Menace off Broadway to the Vineyard Theater, and, uh, and it became a sort of a cult hit and we never went back on stage again. So um, I, told, I told the audience and I, th I told you that I thought Contact, when I saw it, I, I actually sat in the front row at Lincoln Center for this, and I was getting sweat beads from the dancers in my face. Um, I thought it was the most magnificent storytelling I'd ever seen through movement. And um, you told me a great story about what sort of was the what gave you the idea for that from a visual perspective. Can you share that with us? Well, well you never know how a musical comes to be. Either someone brings you a, a book, or you, you find a book that you want to develop into a musical, or someone brings you a film script, and you want to develop it into a musical. Uh, but this was, I had a, a show that actually was with Candor and Ebb and Scott Ellis that we created called Steel Pier. It didn't last very long on Broadway, but Andre Bishop from Lincoln Center saw it and asked me to come up. And he said, if, if you want to do something with us, we will help you develop it. And hearing that from a producer, you never hear that. <laughs> you never hear, I'll help you develop it. So I said, yes, I, I happen to have an idea. Because about two weeks before I had been downtown in the clubs in New York, and um, it was a, there was a dance club. And every good New Yorker was dressed in black. It was around 12 o'clock, 1 in the morning, and then in walked a girl in the yellow dress. And I got obsessed watching her, and she would step forward when she would want to dance with somebody and then retreat back when she was done. 
and then uh, she just disappeared like Brigadoon, she was gone. And it, it just, I, uh, that image of the girl stepping forward in a yellow dress at midnight in New York in, in a sea of black clothing, uh, it just stuck with me. So when Andre said, I'll help you develop something, I thought, well, maybe I could make a story out of a girl in the yellow dress about a girl who, if, if this man doesn't make contact with her, uh, it'll change his life. And if he doesn't make contact with her, he will die. So I called my good friend John Weidman, and uh, we started to work on something. And Lincoln Center gave me 18 dancers in their basement, and, uh, and Contact was born. And it was wonderful. Um, so before you were directing, you were, you were working more as a choreographer, correct? Yes, yes. Um, and I, I know a number of choreographers that have moved to directing, and they've told me why choreographers make good directors. Why don't you tell us why you think choreographers translate very easily to directing? Well, I think if you, if you choreograph for the theater, you're, you're choreographing story. You're, you're there to push the plot forward or push the story along. So you are immersed in the characters. Uh, different from uh, choreographing for the ballet or, or a modern dance company, where it's more abstract. So um, it's only natural when you work with a director. And when I started, I was very lucky that I worked with uh, Trevor Nunn and Nick Heitner and Mike Ockrent, and they were and Hal Prince. So those were my teachers. Those were and, the and four of my idols. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And so when I started choreographing, those were the directors. So to learn from them was wonderful. But but you know, no page goes turned with you don't know what the other person is doing. So it's a natural progression to then want to do something you create and, and, and do the whole evening just as, as a whole journey, especially if it's uh, involving dance. Have you ever directed um, a, a non-dance show? Yes, I did a play about two years ago called Dot. It was written by Coleman Domingo, and it was at the Vineyard Theater. Yes, did very well now, they're, and they're making a television series out of it now. <laughs> um, so speaking of television, you've done theater, you've done television, you've done film. I know what your first love is, but w what's the difference between working on, in theater, working in television, and working in film for you? Well, the, I love the theater the most. I mean, it's, there's no other medium like it. It's a, a, a desperate passion for that show to work, that everybody is in the pool together trying to make that show work. And you swim together and you either get an, a medal or you all drown together. <laughs> but, but you're in it together. Whereas in, in the film world, you, you know, your film crew, you have them and then when you're done filming, you never see those people again. And then you go to another group who edit it. And then when you finish editing, you go to the colorization. And then you go, it, just like you, there are many different um, groups of people. And so it doesn't have that desperate passion. Because um, film people, you know, are right on to the next film, or they all, it's like one foot out the door kind of thing. So it doesn't have the same feeling that you all arrive to a final uh, product. So um, I, I think theater will always be my love. And I, I'm very lucky to go and, and do television. I did the last episode of Curb Your Enthusiasm this year. You have to look for that with Lin-Manuel Miranda. And, uh, and um, uh, yeah, I'm, uh, but I only did that because of uh, Larry David. I wanted to, I had worked with Larry David before. So, so it's not, film or TV is not something I seek or, or look for. I, I, I love the theater and I want to stay in the theater. Um, your interest in new work versus revivals of any kind. Why are you more interested in new work? Well, I, I, after I did uh, Oklahoma on Broadway, I made a conscious effort not to do another revival. I had been offered, and I keep being offered revivals, but I, I wanted to use my energies to create new pieces for the theater. Um, I, I was very lucky that the three big revivals I was involved with were three iconic American musicals. I did um, a big production of Music Man on Broadway and, and a big production of Oklahoma and, and a big one of Showboat. And those three huge productions sort of set me on 
uh, sale to understand uh, how a musical gets put together. And I just wanted to um, just create new pieces. Uh, although now I'm at this age where I'm reviving my own stuff. So <laughs> now I'm doing revivals of my own things. So that's, that happened. So um, uh, one thing I learned today that I didn't really know is that Stroh um, produced, or, or rather directed and choreographed the sh one Broadway musical that won more Tonys than Hamilton, and it was the producers. I mean, I'm sorry, the, um, it was Hamilton. I, I, what did I say? It was the producers. I'm so sorry. I should never have had the, that wine at that party. Um, <laughs> Anyway, I, I don't remember ever laughing so hard at a Broadway musical and having enjoyed it from every angle. Um, so what was it like working with Mel Brooks, first of all, then Nathan Lane and Matthew Broderick, and, and then to make the movie out of it, too? So. Yes. Well, it was a wonderful experience. You know, I, I, um, when Mel Brooks came to New York to ask about me doing The Producers, I was doing a Christmas carol at Madison Square Garden, and uh, it ran there for 10 years. It was a big extravaganza at Madison Square Garden. And uh, Mel wanted to come. I, I got a call there that Mel wanted to come meet me. And I said, oh, well, I could come maybe, he could come maybe on Thursday. And they said, no, he needs to meet you right now. And I said, OK. So <laughs> I went home and uh, prepared to meet him. I already knew all his movies. I was a huge fan, so I, I knew what I was in for. And uh, there was a knock on the door, and I opened the door, and instead of saying hello, he started to sing in full voice, that face, that face, that fabulous face. And he passed me, went down the hallway, danced down the hallway, singing full out, all the way down to my living room, jumped up on the sofa, looked down at me, and said, hello, I'm Mel Brooks. And I thought, well, I don't know what he's here for. I don't know what this is going to be, but I know it would be a great adventure. So I was in. And actually, he, I know, amazing. And Mel and I just did a new version of Young Frankenstein in London, which is going very well. It's a leaner, meaner Young Frankenstein. Um, we, he, he called, and, and now Mel is 92. And he's unbelievable. I mean, unbelievable. And he would call and say, um, Stro, we're going to go do Young Frankenstein in London. I go, okay, okay, Mel, and I'm thinking he's 92. Well, we're not going anywhere. And, and, and then in, a month later, Stro, we're doing Young Frankenstein. And I go, okay. And then he'd come to New York, and we'd go out to dinner and talk about Young Frankenstein. And I'm still thinking this could never happen. And then all of a sudden, there's like an English producer and an English general manager in my office. And I thought, oh, my God, this is really happening. <laughs> We're going to London, and I thought I, I gotta really pay attention here. This is really, this is happening. And yeah, lo and behold, we we went over to London, and Mel wrote. He cut four songs and wrote two new songs. This is at 92, and um, and it's a huge hit in London. It's done in the form of a vaudeville. And uh, yeah, he's amazing. And and you know, he he went to see Hamilton, and he went and backstage at Hamilton, there's a big wall where all the stars come backstage and write their names. And, and Mel went back there and said, I loved it. I hope you win many Tony Awards, but not as many as the producers. <laughs> and they didn't. It was like, <laughs> that would, which made Mel very happy. <laughs> so what was it? I mean, uh, I, I, the chemistry between Nathan and Matthew was unbelievable. And there's never been a matching like that. So I, I you know, having worked with actors that have that kind of chemistry or don't. Sometimes I just sit there and laugh and wonder how we're ever going to get the show up. But what was that like? No, they're, you know, they're wonderful actors and they're, they're very different and each were perfect. Nathan Lane was perfect for Max Bialystok and Matthew was perfect for Leo Bloom and their personalities in every way. Um, and they're, they love the audience. They, they both have a, a Actually, every, uh, the whole cast in that show had the talent um, in comedy to be able to surf the audience, meaning if, an, if a laugh would start to go, Nathan would know that if he touched his face in a certain way, the laugh would go longer. Or if he looked a certain way, he could get the laugh to go longer, and so does Matthew. 
They know how to surf an audience. They feel they're right there with the audience all the time with the breath of an audience. And, and that's something you can't teach. A lot of actors cannot do that, but those two can. Were, were you going to show us something from the producers? Yes, yes. Um, well, it, a couple things. Uh, um, first, um, yes, can we switch over to Springtime for Hitler up there? I think we were going to do something else first. Is that uh, somebody? Is that good? Is that a thumb up? Yeah. Uh, yes, okay. Looks like so, three thumbs so up. So just to say, um, uh, here's a, a clip, it, but just as an example of or choreography, um, sometimes I have to put myself in the frame of mind of what the choreographer is going to do. And in this case, the choreographer was Roger Debris in, in The Producers. And he, he, this particular character, was going to choreograph Springtime for Hitler. So I had to think, what would Roger Debris do if he was going to choreograph Springtime for Hitler? Because it was um, all about trying to do the worst show ever written to steal all the money from the little old ladies, uh, investors. So they had to, they went to the worst director they could find to try to do this. And what happened was that, I don't think the critics realize this, but Mel Brooks wrote this because the critics get it wrong. They say it's a satirical masterpiece. So in fact, um, instead of the show being a flop, it becomes a huge hit because the critics got it wrong. I don't think the real critics really understand that. <laughs> but um, so, and you'll see, um, when, we, when I first did this, I didn't know if it was going to be a hit or not. I didn't know. Uh, uh, we were in a big studio, and because uh, I, we were doing this kind of stuff, I made them, every time we did the number, I made them pull the shades down, because I thought, well, somebody in their apartment over there is going to look in and think it's some kind of wild group over here. So every time we got to that number, the shades went down, and <laughs> so no one could see it, you know. Um, but it, in fact, it, it, uh, it had ended up OK. But so let's, let's watch a little of Springtime for Hitler. You immerse yourself in the world of Mel Brooks, so it's a little different. So everything you do, uh, even a set designers and costume designer, all had to be funny. Everybody had to be comically inclined. And, and even at the auditions, you had to sing a song, you had to do a dance combination, you had to read, but then you had to tell a joke in front of Mel Brooks, your own joke, to get into the show. So you ha we had to know that you were inherently funny. Um, I'm curious, uh, having seen the Broadway production and the film, um, the film looks like it gave you a, a little bit more range in terms of what, how you could do the musical numbers. Sure. I, well, it's interesting. I was when I, we had to do the swastika with the mirror behind us. I went to Robin Wagner, the set designer, and I said, "And then I need a mirror that can go like that, and I'll and I'll make a swastika." He goes, "You don't have enough people." And I said, "Oh, um, yes, I do." He goes, "No, you don't have enough people." And I say, "I'm sure I do." No. So we worked it out, and I didn't have enough cast members. So then um, I had the idea. Well, what if I had two puppets on each side? So in fact, in the Broadway show. There were two puppets on each side, one dancer that did this. They were all wired up with each other. So when the dancer did that, so did the puppets. But, um, but you know, I mean, it, uh, in a way, that was more creative than just having, you know, enough people. Yeah, yeah. that was great. Um, is there something else you wanted to show us? Yes, there's, um, well, as an example of, of that kind of research that one does, uh, um, in Oklahoma, there's the farmer and the cowman that you know, but when I was asked to do Oklahoma at the Royal National Theater, I had to ask the Rogers and Hammerstein estate to uh, allow me to change the dance arrangements to match my choreography because when I choreograph, I, I do the arrangement also of the music. Um, it's very important to me that when a dancer leaps in the air, so does the orchestra. So you'll notice in this particular um, DVD of Farmer and the Cowman, uh, that, that the orchestrations go with the choreography. Plus, uh, this one is different from the original. Uh, it, Oklahoma took place at the turn, um, turn of the century, people fighting for territory. And so that informed me about the choreography, that the choreography be, would be more fight-oriented or playing Can You Top This? And 
um, and that it, it certainly was about fighting for open t territory and open land. So once you immerse yourself in the research, um, the the images just come, and the women are much more pioneer women and strong prairie women than I think were in, in the original. So this is an example of, and, and you'll see, um, there's a big movie star in this, you see if you can spot him. Um, but uh, you'll see how the music has been changed to match my choreography. It's not that music, it's not. <laughs> Thank you. 
So there was um, Hugh somebody or other was the TV star, Hugh something or whatever? Yeah, Hugh Jackman. <laughs> Did everybody see Hugh Jackman up there? 
<laughs> so I'm really curious about the the dance music arranger process and whether whether you choreograph and then he arranges to that or whether you sit down and say I want a little of this a little of that and then you work together we, we work together actually if I, I, I think about the story first and what I do is change the time signature of the music to evoke an emotion for example I, I, I did a show called crazy for you and there's a there's a thank you and there's a Hopefully that's coming back as a revival now, because <laughs> that's 25 years now. Um, but uh, there's a, a song in there called Shall We Dance? So for example, if I want the two leads, Bobby and Polly, to be um, uh, shy with each other, I'll, I'll play that in a soft shoe rhythm. If I want them to chase each other, I'll play that melody in a fast two. And if I want them to fall in love with each other, I'll play the melody in three quarter time. So in fact, manipulating the time signature of the music helps to evoke emotion from the audience, whether they know it or not. So I work with the dance arranger, who is a great pianist, and we take that melody and then we play it in the different time signatures to come up uh, with a full um, uh, number. So, so the writer, Ken Ludwig, does not have to write, and then they fell in love, I'm able to do it through the music and the dance. So by the end of the dance, they have fallen in love. And if you could, you could tell a little bit there about when the music sounded different when the girls came out, the sounded different when the boys came out. So it was all done as I choreographed. And we, we sort of worked that out, out together. That's great. Is there anything else you want to show us before we open it up for questions? Well, we could do a short, um, what if we just did uh, the short Bullets Over Broadway one? And this is a good example of, how the collaboration with set designer and costume designer, the more you know about the other departments, the better off your work is going to be because I could make the most um, um, beautiful dance step, but if, if the girl's wearing the wrong dress, it's not gonna matter. Or I can make a beautiful dance step, but if it's not lit right, it's not gonna matter. So it's a great collaboration here. Uh, and, and in this particular one, you'll see the gangsters, I told the costume designer, William Ivy Long, that they, they run in like cockroaches and they run out again. They run like cockroaches in New York City. So he took uh, the research of the backs of cockroaches and <laughs> the colors of cockroaches and put them in the suits of all the gangsters. So all the gangsters have a little bit different color suit that matches the backs of real cockroaches. The other thing is that the show takes place in the 20s and Usually those dresses were quite straight, but I needed the girls to spin and I wanted the fabric to spin. So William designed dresses that when the girls stand there, they look like they can't move, but when they spin, they spin straight out. So it's a, a, a great collaboration with all the designers to make a, a musical successful. So let's, let's just, this is a very short one. This is a very short one, so let's show this.
So that's definitely, you know, set in the 20s and everything about it looks that way. Santa La Cuesta did a beautiful set and, and it's, it is a, it's, it's, again, immersing yourself in uh, the time period, the, where it takes place and, and, um, and just making sure you're on the same page with all the designers. And, uh, you know, so it's when you finally see something that's, that was just a mere sketch on a table to actually see it dance, it's a, th a thrilling moment. Great, so um, I think we're gonna open it up to questions, but I'm, I actually have a question that I meant to ask you this afternoon, and I hope it doesn't strike the wrong chord, but uh, one of my favorite musicals that I thought was ingenious in the way you staged it was Scottsboro Boys. And I thought the content was marvelous. Your approach to it was so clever, and yet it, it didn't work in New York. Um, financially, it didn't work in New York for, a lot, for some reasons, but it's enjoying so many wonderful productions around the country in regional professional theaters and elsewhere. So w tell me about that experience and just how it felt to have such an amazing piece of work on stage that people just didn't get. Well, it you know, it, in fact, it it won the best musical in London two years ago. So it did very well in London, and uh, it it played the regionals. I ended up directing it about six times across the country, and it did very well everywhere, everywhere else but in New York. Um, it it was a show that's quite dear to us, and and. Um, actually, saying before about how shows come to be. Uh, I had done so many shows with, with Kander and Neb now that we wanted to do another show together. So sometimes you just want to do a show with a creative team and you don't know what you want yet or you don't have an idea, but you just, we sat around Fred Ebb's living room, uh, his kitchen table rather, and tried to think of what we could do together. And we thought to do something that was true, something that was real, something that was historical. Um, because mostly in the musical world, you're in a fantastical world or make-believe world. So we wanted to do something that was true. We started to research the, the 10 greatest trials in America. And of course, the Scottsboro Boys was right there. And Kander Neb jumped on it right away because it was about nine African-American um, young men who were accused of a horrific crime that they did not commit. And, but it changed, uh, it changed a lot of things in the uh, judicial system. Uh, it was the very beginning of civil rights and um, Rosa Parks uh, marched for them and knew them. So uh, that, those trials had a profound impact on, uh, on civil rights. So we started to write it and Kander and Neb, um, they jumped right on it because they write for the underdog. They write maybe this time I'll get lucky. How lucky can you get? They, they were so into it. And uh, uh, the Scottsboro Boys were called the Scottsboro Boys as if they were a vocal group or something. You knew the names of the jurors and you knew the names of the, um, the, um, the judge and the reporters, but you never knew their names. So Kander Neb wanted to make sure that you knew the nine boys' names. And um, the show w did very well off Broadway, and and of course now it's it's done quite a bit, but I think it was not marketed correctly, and that's I think our produ the producer that did it on Broadway didn't quite know how to market it, and uh, so I think, and it was at a time where you could see Mamma Mia or you could see the Scottsboro Boys if you were coming to town, and I think um, people didn't know what it was, and I think they chose Mamma Mia that week, so. <laughs> Um, but it, it is, uh, you know, there's talk of a movie, so that's a good thing. Oh, that's that great. That would be a wonderful thing. All right, shall we take some questions from the group? I'll come back to you. I think we have one over there. Oh, oh sorry. Hi. Hi, Susan. It's Bob Moore. Hi. <laughs> Hi you I remember from our days at Candlelight how you incorporated props into your choreography, and I know you use that in a lot of your shows like crazy for you. Are you still doing that? Well, I do, you know, I use props if it's uh, appropriate for the piece. Um, crazy for you, it was quite appropriate because it, there was a feed store, a general store on stage, and 
and uh, you needed to show how you made rhythm for I Got Rhythm, so we brought out pickaxes and mining pans and, and the likes. But it is, it, it always, you know, if I was doing a, a number um, about uh, doing an interview, I would probably have a bottle of water and a mic on stage and, and perhaps flip that bottle of water or something. But uh, I always try to um, make the prop come out of a real situation. And a prop actually helps gr uh, ground the character. You believe it more. So I, I do use them, but I always try to make it as real as possible. Nice to see you. <laughs> Hello, it's good to see you, Susan. <laughs> but I still know you as Sue. Okay. And hello, a, hello. <laughs> there are many of us in the room who have worked with you before, and but there are several here who may not know you. And one of the little known facts, aside, well, you have amazing talent, but one thing that you might not all know is that you have a heart as big as this room. <laughs> and it's just, it's, I want you all to know that. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. It was so. Your, your huge heart was so evident in your direction of one of your lesser known shows, which is Big Fish, which I absolutely loved. And uh, just tell me a little bit about your experience with that. Well, um, yes, we did Big Fish on Broadway and sadly it didn't, it didn't last very long. Uh, and I'm not sure why it was, it certainly is a beautiful, beautiful story. Um, and I think everyone in the cast, uh, loved it. Everyone, I think, had some story about their father um, who, and I think if you're in the theater, you're in the theater because someone told you big fish stories. And I know my father told me big fish stories. I still don't know if half of them are true. My, my Aunt Phyllis could tell me if they were true or not. She's here. But um, I think, you know, you're in the theater because someone told you stories. And so for all of us who worked on the show, uh, it was it was very sad that it closed. You just never know. You don't know what's going to be a hit or not. You really don't. And you know, you do your best and and you hope for the best. And and uh, it's it is very sad when these shows don't run or don't or are not loved like you love them because you you birth them like your children and they and someone doesn't love them. You know, so it's 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 quite difficult. You know, the thing is, I I make sure, and I was taught this by Hal Prince, who was taught this by George Abbott, that after the day a show opens, the very next day I start another show. I go a meeting for another show. So no matter what happens, I'm in a meeting for another show, whether they liked it or not. It's it's a good thing to do. I think the perfect example of the size of her heart was the funeral scene in that show. I mean, I, if there was one heart that wasn't broken in the theater, they were not a human being, but it was, a, it was wonderful. We have anybody else over here? Sure. This is a question about leadership. Uh, I was intrigued by your, your comment about how in theater everyone swims together or drowns together. Um, what have you learned about just working with people and sort of bringing large groups of people together on a common mission? Well, the thing is, you, you can't, you have to leave your egos outside the door. You, it's it's a, a true collaboration. The theater is a real collaboration. And someone could have a rotten idea, but <laughs> they need to say it because then someone could take that idea and turn it into gold. So you just need to respect each other. It has a great deal to do with respect and respect in the room. And you can have some crazy artists all around you, but even the craziest artist has to leave his ego outside. And I think that's that's the thing. It's it's um, it's giving respect to one another because that's all you really need to succeed and go forward. Oh, it's over here. Oh, it's on. Hi. Sorry. <laughs> um, some years ago, you did. Uh, among many fabulous shows, um, something from a, uh, a painting, uh, The Girl on a Swing, that ran on a, basically on a double bill with contact, which was amazing. But how, can you talk about what your process is to go from basically a two-dimensional painting to create this whole wonderful world? Well, that was, um, it was a piece called The Girl on the Swing, and it's a 
based on a Fragonard painting that I saw at the Wallace Museum in London. And it was a beautiful painting of a girl on a swing and, and one man is pushing her and the, and the one man looks like he might be his, the, the husband. And then there's a servant there and um, they look like they're all having a good time. <laughs> And I, and I thought, well, what is this painting about? And then I see that the artist has drawn a Cupid on the side going like that. And I thought, well, something ornery has gone on here in this painting. It's not just a girl on the swing. So I started to, um, I got a swing. I could build a, got a swing built in the studio and had three actors. And we fooled around on the swing what we could do. But in fact, I, I came up with the idea that in fact, um, they were role playing, then the servant became the husband, the husband became the servant. So who knows if Fragonard really meant that, but clearly um, by what he, uh, other things he painted in the, in the painting meant something ornery was going on. But I, I do, I go to the museums a lot. I, I go, uh, that's what I do on my time off. I go to art museums and um, we have another show that I did with Lynn Ahrens and Stephen Flaherty that's coming up. I did a production of Little Dancer at the Kennedy Center. And now we're going to Seattle, uh, the Fifth Avenue in Seattle, and hopefully we'll come into Broadway. Um, but it's based on Degas' painting of the a little dancer uh, uh, age 14. And Tyler Peck, who's a beautiful dancer from New York City Ballet, plays the ballerina. And uh, we have brought to life that time. But that is from staring at that sculpture and thinking, well, who is this little girl? And then I did a little research, and in fact, she did exist. And there's a little bit of history on her, that she, she was um, a dancer, the Paris Opera Ballet, and she had, there was three sisters, her mother was a laundress, and, and from just that little information, we were able to write a musical about her. So fingers crossed you'll see that on Broadway someday. That was part of my question, because the shows that you've choreographed for are so stylistically different, different periods of, in history. Do you do a lot of research and background so that the steps that you choreograph are true to the period and the style of the show that you're choreographing for? Yes, yes, I do a lot of research, but for example, um, in Contact, there was swing dancing, but in fact it wasn't true swing dance, it's sort of my version of swing dancing. So I take sort of what it, what's truth of the period and then, and then sort of uh, appropriate it for my own um, art. Um, and, and also for um, an audience of this particular time. Uh, even in Little Dancer, I, I hint at that sort of chiquetti, the, the kind of form of dance that was done at the turn of the century there, but in, in, in fact, it, it has a, a more contemporary feel in the, in the big ballet at the end. Uh, but yes, I immersed myself, you know, even in like a revival like Showboat, the way you, they danced in the North was very different from the way they danced in the South. And finding about, uh, out about that and finding out, in fact, that the Charleston was invented by the African Americans in the South and then taken and brought up to the North. And, it, and people think it was, was born in the North, but it wasn't, it was born in the South. So yes, it's finding, finding out information like that, which is like gold. Well, even working on the Scottsboro Boys, who, who, I, no, the finding out Rosa Parks' March for the Scottsboro Boys gave us the whole ending of the show. And that was just found out by doing research. Susan, what inspired you when you were growing up and when you realized what your calling was? Well, I, I have to say I grew up, my father was a great piano player. My, actually, um, uh, my grandmother uh, played the piano. My Aunt Phyllis plays the piano, who's here today. And uh, my brother plays the piano. So I grew up with music in the house. And my father played the piano every day in the house. And um, I was in a dancing school when I was about five years old. I started at Anna Marie Leo's dance studio. And then I, I went to... Um, James Jameson, the Academy of Dance, and then Delaware Dance Center. I think Jane is here. She's out here today. So um, uh, I, it was, but I have to say it was my, my parents who introduced me to music, especially my father. And then, and then it was making it a big deal if there was a Fred and Ginger 
movie on television. Everybody, everything stopped. Everyone got in front of the television. <laughs> and it was very important to watch that. And, and I, at a very young age, I think that's when I understood music and dance, and that when Fred Astaire kicks his leg, the whole orchestra kicks or when Ginger goes flying in the air, so does the orchestra. And I was able to recognize that so that when I now choreograph, that's why I work with the arranger and the orchestrator to match the choreography. Hi. Uh, I was intrigued by your comment about the, um, the critics getting it wrong uh, on produ in the producer's plot. and. Um, and in thinking about, um, I really like to hear more about the new production of Young Frankenstein and, and whether uh, you actually pay attention to what the critics said or whether you're reimagining it as purely based on uh, let's try it a different way. Well, that I think um, uh, we ran on Broadway for two years and then it actually did very well on tour, Young Frankenstein. But um, I think Mel always wanted, we were in a huge barn of a theater, and I think it wasn't good for the comedy. So he always wanted to try it again, and I can't believe it actually happened. <laughs> but when we go to, went to London, we were in a 700-seat theater, and it, we changed it to be in the form of a vaudeville, so it's all drops and footlights and hard-edge spots. So the comedy is right in the audience's lap. And I think that made the difference in the show. Before we played a big barn and you, it, the comedy wasn't the same. And I think for, for Mel it was, the you know, he's used to close-ups on comedy in his films. So I think it always hurt him that it never got its due. So that's why at 92 <laughs> we did it again and did it in London as a big hit. Hello. I'm just wondering if you think back to all of the work that you've done in the past, barring a scenario where there would be a revival, is there anything that you look at and think, oh, I would have a completely different vision for that now? And if you do, how do you get that out? Do you just kind of note things down in a journal? What do you do? How do you kind of cope with looking at something and thinking, oh, you would change it, but you can't. Uh, well, you mean of my own work? Of my yes. own work? Of my own work, yeah. Well, I've just had the wonderful experience of, um, I was asked to do a revival of Crazy For You, and we, we went into a workshop lab situation where we set up everything in New York in a studio, and we rehearsed for four weeks, and we made some cuts and changes, and um, and neck and crazy for you was a big hit, but now to bring it back 25 years later, it, it, an audience is different. So I did make changes according to a more contemporary audience. Um, and, and with the Me Too movement, uh, there are some jokes in there that we don't need anymore. And, um, and it's okay, there are a million other jokes to be done, but uh, it was good to go back at it. Um, but uh, I think, I always want to do something new, so I don't really ever have that um, thought of going back. Um, so it just, but it just so happened that it just went back twice with Young Frankenstein and, and Crazy Feel. But it's not something that I think about. I think this may sound like a silly question, but was that Mark Harmon as the good-looking Nazi, the blonde guy? N no. <laughs> no, he's a British fella. I can't think of his name. Um, hello. Oh, Aunt Phyllis, yeah. Yes, yep, Crazy Few is all Gershwin music. I did. A lot of times when you, uh, when you have, uh, go to uh, do shows that have uh, composers that exist in composers like the Gershwins or Rodgers and Hammerstein or Kern, you do have to go and get the rights and tell them what you're going to do or what you are planning on doing. 
And um, so we did have to go to the Gershwins and ask them about Crazy Few initially. Um, and uh, they were very happy to give us the rights. And, and even this time around, we still had to go back 25 years later and tell them what our thoughts were to redo it. So these, these um, estates have big families that, and lawyers. And, and, and even in the Oklahoma that you saw, I had to go and ask to change the dance arrangements. That had never been changed ever before. So you do have to do a little bit of a song and dance, <laughs> if you will, to get the rights for these things. They wouldn't be making any money now. Hello. Um, I'm a senior here at CAB, and um, myself and many of my friends are about to go off to college a lot for performance, and some are headed out to just do auditions. So I was wondering if you have advice for those who are entering the theater world and the music world, and what you would say to them and hope for, for success. Well, you know, the, actually the story that I told before about what's the worst that can happen, someone could say no, I think is a good one. I think you should really put yourself out there and try things and go out and audition for everything. And, um, and don't be afraid. It's, I think it's, it's um, being brave. You have to be very brave, for one thing, to conquer New York. That's a whole character in itself. But the more you know, the better off you're going to be. The more education you have, the better off you're going to be. But the more, whatever show you're auditioning for also, the more you know about it, the creative team or what the show is about, um, the better off you're going to be to present yourself. You know, you wouldn't um, audition for Oklahoma in black fishnet stockings and, you know, big makeup. But you might if you were auditioning for Chicago. So um, you can't always think that everybody in the room behind the table has an imagination. You know, uh, the director will and the choreographer will, but sometimes the producers won't. And so the more you can help, not that you have to dress in costume or anything, but the more information you know about everything you're about to present yourself, um, who the composers are. You know, you would present yourself differently for a Sondheim musical. You and you would be different for a Lynn Aarons and Stephen Flaherty musical. It would be different for a Mel Brooks musical. You know, so it's, it's, it's presenting yourself and, and being comfortable in your skin. Um, the idea when someone comes into me, if they're very, very nervous, I'm not going to want to work with them because they're going to make me nervous. <laughs> so they need to come in and present themselves like they're sure of themselves. And the only way you can be sure of yourself is to do the homework to prepare yourself for that. Hi, Susan. Thanks so much for giving us your time tonight. I know how busy you are. I uh, wanted to put you in the seat of the audience and find out what in the past few years as an audience member you've said, wow, I didn't expect that, or how did they do that? Well, Hamilton, of course, is a genius piece of theater. Um, and I did have a, wow, how did he do that? How did he write that? It's pretty amazing. And, and it's, what, what was great about Hamilton, too, is that people invested in it. Because you can imagine someone explaining that to some investor. <laughs> what, I'm going to rap about George Washington, he's going to be black. I mean, it's, it's, I could see an investor going, what? What, are you crazy? And the fact that investors... Uh, jumped in there and helped the show go forward. Now, you know, that was a great thing for them. But it opened up, too, for investors to take chances again, because that's why you have seen so many revivals coming back. It's been revival after revival, because people are afraid to take a chance on something new. They'd rather go watch Phantom for the 15th time than, than try something new. So I think Hamilton opened a whole, whole um, uh, just new generation of people taking chances on new work, which is wonderful. Also, Dear Evan Hansen is, is an incredible piece of theater, which is running on Broadway right now. It's, it's also, I think, genius. Um, but, you know, I, it's, I, go, I go out every night in New York. I'm very lucky to live in New York. So I either go to the ballet, or I go to, to the opera, or I go to the theater, or Carnegie Hall. I mean, I'm, I, I just love it so much. I can't get enough of it. 
So um, it's, it, it's something that feeds me. I, I can't sit home. I have to be out watching something. I know when my Aunt Phyllis tries to call me, I'm never home. I'm always out. Um, but I, I, those two shows, of course, are a must-see in New York if you go. And say, I, maybe I'll take the uh, take a question. So, you, know, you and I talked a little bit earlier. That I, I look at the the dancing, and uh, for lack of a better term, for me, it looks like herding cats. <laughs> it's and and so I, my question to you is is how do you start a process for choreography, for you? Do you, do you visualize it in your head, all of these moving parts, or do you take one part at a time and add on? How, how do you put so much in front of us that looks so together? How, do, how is that done? Well, I, us I usually, as I say, I work with an arranger on the music, because I think through the music or the story. Um, but I do visualize music, and I always have, ever since I was a little girl. If I hear a rock and roll song or a classical piece, or an old standard, I imagine hordes of people dancing through my head. <laughs> so I'm glad this all worked out. I cuss would have gone crazy, I suppose. But I do visualize music, and so music is not a relaxing entity for me. It's, I, I <laughs> it makes me uh, see, see visions. So, but um, I usually start with the principles, like, uh, and I have to become those principles. Like Max Bialystok dances very differently from Leo Bloom. So I would become Max Bialystok when I was creating his dancing, or I'd become Leo Bloom when I was creating his dancing. So you become that character as you're working it out. It can't just be about dance steps in the theater. It has to always be backed up with motivation and character, or it won't mean anything. Yes, my Aunt Phyllis just said, yeah, I could tell you about how terrified my mother and father were about me going to New York. They were. <laughs> I did. I fell in love with New York. I have a question. With ticket prices really becoming quite astronomical for live theater, especially in New York, DC, and arts funding being cut from public and private schools. How do you think that us as a country of people should be trying to develop arts, the love and passion for arts that you developed at a young age in the children in today's society? Well, it is expensive in New York. It's 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 gotten out of hand. The, the I have to say though, a lot of the unions it has to do with stagehand unions and musician unions and um, and theater owners. Uh, it it has it has shot the ticket prices up. It's it's very very difficult. Um, I think it's there are um, though some shows that have student ticket sales and. And special, you know, front row um, um, kind of um, where you line up and you get there early and all that kind of stuff. I think it's finding out that kind of stuff. But in in um, introducing your own children to the theater, I think is is something like I was. I watch Fred and Ginger movies on TV, but now there are a lot of musicals to be watched on television, and introducing them to musicals that way is wonderful, but also making sure they go to the community theaters, making sure they go to Candlelight, and making sure they go um, everywhere, you know, it, down to the University of Delaware, to the theater department down there. Um, and Delaware Theater Company. Uh, yes, and the <laughs> Delaware Theater Company. And the Delaware Theater Company, of course. Um, but it's, it's finding out what's happening around town. I think a lot of people don't actually look to see what's happening. Uh, and I look every day to see what's happening in the paper, what's going on. You gotta find out what's going on. And I think it's, it's um, taking your kids down to these theaters and there's nothing like live theater. There is nothing like it. It's, and, and for that one night, that, uh, that cast is doing it for that audience and it'll never be done the same again. When an audience sees a cast do something, they're seeing it only for them. It'll never be the same any other night. 
You know, there's nothing like it, and, and trying to introduce children to this at an early age is important. That's right. Yes, the things on television are silly, and Phyllis says. <laughs> Hi, Susan. I want to thank you for coming tonight. I came up around the same time you did, and I did theater in Pennsylvania, and in all in black, so I understand that. But I want to give you kudos, because your genius is obvious, but for as a woman to be as successful as you've been, I mean, that's a, that's a ceiling that's been very hard to break. And since I came up at the very same time, I really appreciate your artistry and your genius because it was very hard for women, I'm sorry this is hard, to, um, to be successful and to break through those boundaries. And I give you such kudos and congratulations Thank for your you. genius. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I just wanted to ask you, um, were you able to see um, some theater in London? Because at one time it was very cheap to go to London and, and see the theater and be influenced for whatever work that was done here. Because uh, Broadway was quite expensive compared to the, the British shows that were done. Yes. No, it, it's still, it's much easier to, in London to go to the theater and there's much more theater. They have fringe theater. There's theater everywhere. Every time you open a door, there's a theater in there. It's, uh, it's just so much of it. and. Um, uh, and it's somehow respected a little bit more there, I think, somehow. I'm not sure. And they have, but they, you know, it's, it's government subsidized too. The government helps the theaters out. Uh, the government does everything to make the national theater great. The Young Vic, they get, sub, they get grants. They're able to, the smallest theater gets grants, the biggest theaters get grants. So that doesn't happen in America. Um, you know, we, we have to, to rely on the generosity of, of uh, donors and, and um, people who love the theater, people who love it in their heart to help us out. Um, but so it, there is more theater in London. It's a different vibe over there. Hi, Sue, it's Hi. Lena. Hi, Lena. <coughs> I was wondering the whole time, how do you make out directing the Prince of Broadway when you were working with the Prince of Broadway? I, I just did a show with Hal Prince on Broadway called The Prince of Broadway about Hal Prince. And I worked with Hal on that. And um, Hal and I are very good friends. We did the big showboat together. And, um, and we've always stayed very good friends. And uh, he asked me to help him put together an evening that sort of celebrated his work, which is remarkable. When you, he has 21 Tony Awards, and um, the, just the amount of shows that he's created that are groundbreaking. Um, and, and so we did a, a something for the Manhattan Theater Club. It was a limited run, and, uh, it, and it went very well, and Hal was, Hal was so pleased. Um, and he's turning, he just turned 90. Yeah, he just turned 90. And again, sharp and quick, and so it's good to stay involved in the theater. I guess. I know. Mel Brooks attributes his longevity to walking around the block every day and singing show tunes. Hi, Susan. Um, first, I want to say I, I took dance from Miss Jane, and my kids also do. So oh, good. We have that in common. Um, my question is more personal. Um, my daughter accidentally got a national tour and dropped out of college, and I received some backlash from that. So I, didn't, I just wanted your opinion on how you feel about something like that, if she should be going back to school immediately or try to you know, continue what she's doing. So uh, she is the national tour for a long time? Is that? It was for a year, and they just asked her to do a second year, and so we don't know if she should go back to school. Or oh, I think she should go back to school. OK. Yeah. But, uh, but I think that's wonderful that she got, got that um, tour. Experience for you. Yeah, that, that experience is everything, you know, and, and to be with theater people. She's going to turn out OK. Yeah. Well, I think um, it's easy to see why she's won five Tonys. It's also, um, I, the body of work, I mean, she, she raves about Hal Prince, an unbelievable body of work the man has. But I, you know, she is a close second in terms of the body of work and the thought that goes into it. And I was chatting with Hal Prince one time about a show that he wanted me to get involved with. And he said he wouldn't do a show again without 
Stro because she always has his back. So um, we want to thank you all. We want to thank you so much for coming tonight and for spending this time. And um, and thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. See you all in the theater. Thank you so much. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thank you.